Okay, so Kyle Gorman on productivity and phenology. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, thank you, Charles. I'm happy to be invited. This is exciting. This is one of my favorite conferences to be at, um, so I'm excited to be involved. Uh, today's talk is just some of my musings on productivity and how it might interact with a phenology. I don't pretend this is a full accounting of the interactions between productivity and phenology, merely some first thoughts and like maybe some conjectures I think I can argue. Um, there's quite, probably quite a bit more to be said about the role of productivity in phenology. Similarly, there's all, all the big ideas in generative grammar. Most of them need more attention in phenology. Um, I would love to hear more about poverty of stimulus arguments in phenology, for instance. Uh, but here are a couple of the things I'd like to maybe loosely argue here. Uh, the first one is that product, uh, phenology is productive in approximately the same way that syntax is, or at least there's some certain commonalities between um, the, uh, the sort of Chomsky in form or the Humboldtian form of productivity as it exists in phenology and syntax. Uh, second, um, productivity can be seen in sort of the distribution of what I'm gonna call morphophonological magic. I'll explain what that is. Um, loss of productivity uh, may trigger lexical restructuring, uh, suggesting that productivity sort of determines what our lexicon and rules look like, or rather it's loss. And finally, I'm gonna argue that uh, some things identified as uh, phonotactic generalizations may not exhibit productivity in some relevant sense. First one is actually pretty easy. This is something I just, I just sat down and thought of literally last night. Um, I'm gonna claim that phonology is in some sense productive the way that syntax is. So Chomsky quotes, commonly from von Humboldt, um, Alexander von Humboldt. The actual source is obscure. I don't think anyone's ever really been able to figure out why Chomsky says von Humboldt said this, um, but uh, the form he gives it is either the infinite use of finite means, where uh, uh, the infinite use refers to awful lot of sentences and finite means refers to a finite set of rules and, and a finite lexicon and so on and so forth. Or another form, which is even more general and it isn't just linguistic in nature, excuse me, is discrete infinity. Um, I think that people who are familiar with the substance-free enterprise will be familiar with the importance of this notion of discrete infinity. Um, you know, I don't know why Chomsky quotes von Humboldt for this, but granted Chomsky has also said that citation practices aren't important at all and nobody cares. Uh, so he's just practicing what he preaches. Uh, so sort of semi-trivial example you're probably familiar with is, is possessor embedding in English. English permits possessor embedding. You can have possessors of possessors. So you can say things like the queen's corgis barked, uh, the queen's butler's enormous suit uh, needs to be sent to the wash. Uh, the queen's son's lawyer's legal brief argues that he should not be remanded to FBI custody, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so from a descriptivist point, you say, okay, yes, English is possessor embedding, duh. I'm not gonna talk about like how you implement that. In fact, I don't even really know because I'm not a syntax machine. Uh, but from a broader perspective, this we'll call the Chomsky and universalist approach. Um, we'd say, oh, look, UG admits grammars that have possessor embedding. Something about, that is a, something in the hypothesis space is possessors that contain possessors. That's a possible uh, configuration of a grammar or, or of a subgrammar, perhaps you should, we should say. Okay, so obvious point for some of you, but maybe not all of you. Well, what about Piraha? Piraha is a uh, supposedly an isolate spoken on the border of Brazil with, I think, Venezuela. Um, and it's described in work by uh, Daniel Everett as lacking possessor embedding. Uh, here I'm pulling the examples uh, from Nevins et al. who have the examples from Everett's, Everett's work in both the 80s and the 2000s. So the first one is one possessor is okay. Um, that's, it seems obvious from this gloss that that's exactly what this is. Um, we simply have, uh, the configuration here looks something like uh, um, pos possessor possessed and then some, and uh, that's all you have to do is possessor possessed, right? And then you have verb, verbal agreement morphology and the copula. So that's something like this is so and so shotgun. However, you can't you can't recurse. You can't do that. You can't say something like somebody's son's daughter. That is not fine. Does not work. Uh, that is out. Uh, so this. You say, okay, well, the, maybe possessor embedding isn't a universal. Well, it isn't a Greenbergian universal. Certainly there are languages that don't have it. Uh, and Piraha is, is a language that doesn't have it. Everett finds this to be very telling and suggests that the whole Chomsky and enterprise is on the wrong direction. Well, what about German? The language also lacks possessor embedding. These are once examples from Nevins et al, but they're easy to construct. So Hansen's Auto, 
um, when possessor is okay, but you can't do you can't do Hansen's auto smotok. Um, that's out. Um, there's no way to put a possessor inside of a possessor. But for the Chomsky and Universalist, it doesn't matter. Some languages have this restriction. Yeah, sure. Um, but clearly, UG allows possessor embedding, and we've uh, by simply discovering English and a second language that doesn't have it, we've discovered the Chomsky and Universal. Um, I leave it to, for, to you to draw your conclusions about whether there's some kind of, I don't know, uh, exotification playing a role in how we talk about these phenomena. Um, but given that German and Piraha are quite similar, um, yet here we are. So syntactic architecture, very heavily simplified. Um, in the modern format, because it's like the input to this, what we call the narrow syntax is traditionally called enumeration. Don't ask me why it's called enumeration and not, I don't know, a set, but it's a set of lexical items. Then there are two operations closely related, one called merge, which combines constituents into a larger constituent. This is the thing that allows us to create un sentences of unbounded length. This is the kind of thing that Chomsky has in mind when he talks about discrete infinity or uh, uh, infinite, infinite use, et cetera. Uh, there is also the second component, which is often viewed as a special case of merge, or in some is called internal merge, which is move. Move combines the subconstituent of X with X itself, create, and this creates not longer sentences, but it creates longer dependencies, which can be, once again, potentially unbounded. I, I'm going to argue that, that move is a little bit like phonology, uh, heavily simplified. So the input to a narrow phonology, let's assume, um, is that there's an underlying representation consisting of sequences of feature bundles, which are constructed by operations like head movement and lexical insertion. Perhaps you also believe in things like this phenomena of local dislocation proposed by distributed morphologists. Uh, perhaps you think there's something where affix, maybe some affixes aren't specified for their polarity, like whether they're prefixes or suffixes or infixes yet. Perhaps there's other stuff going on, but basically that the input is a sequence of feature bundles. Um, the, there is no clear analog to merge. Phonology doesn't make doesn't like make bigger pieces of words. That's something that I think um, the, the syntax and perhaps a sem semi-autonomous morphology does. I don't think you can possibly argue that phonology has an analog to merge. But the distance between the triggers for phonological processes and the undergoers may be unbounded in some cases. We know a phenomena like unbounded tone spreading, unbounded vowel harmony long distance dissimulation. Uh, these are all extremely well, well known phenomena that happen in phonology. Once again, it doesn't matter that some languages don't have uh, long distance sibilant harmony, but others do. Uh, is this the same thing as move? I don't know, but I kind of think the answer ought to be yes. And some approaches to phonology in, in, my, in my reading of them, like a uh, work of, like, of my friend Fred Mayo, who I say is on the call, uh, perhaps Ramey, can, can be seem to be making these connections more explicit and saying this is actually a useful way to talk about things is to use this work about uh, search, et cetera, I think is a good example of that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> obviously, when quite a big question in syntax is, in modern syntax is like, what's the relationship between movement and agreement? Um, and I can't answer that question, but clearly, uh, the th things we call like agreement often look a lot like movement and, th and the things we call movement often look like long distance phonology to me. So I hope somebody else can fill this out in their head and it, this is already triggering some thoughts. Uh, at, the, at the very, I think there's, there's something to be said for uh, phono phonology has this discrete, uh, discrete infinity property um, to some degree that mimicking uh, the movement property of syntax. That's just a thought I had. That's the first, first and very easy uh, claim I'd like to make. The second one I want to claim is that productivity governs the distribution of what I'm going to call morphophonological magic. Uh, I'll explain what this is in a second. Um, these are pulled from two little thought experiments that I blogged about a while ago. Um, and I'm going to go pull up my notes for that real quickly here. Um, you can read these later if you really want to. Um, you know, Obviously, a lot of stuff we know about language that we speak includes information about lexical, lexically arbitrary behaviors, behaviors that are specific to certain roots or segments and absent in superficially similar roots or segments. Uh, the first, first and most obvious example of this that comes to mind is something like the behavior of obesity, which it fails to undergo uh, trisyllabic shortening. This is discussed in Sound Pattern of English. So you can compare like serene serenity 
to obese, obes uh, obese obesity as opposed to obese obesity. I actually almost said it there. Such, such phenomena are really common in the world's languages. I've, I've never studied a language that doesn't have some of this. Um, uh, so some examples that I want to talk about real quickly are the, um, those of the Romance mid-vowel metaphonies and the Slavic fleeting vowels. Uh, one second here, I'm going to advance my slides. Sorry, I got to do this. I'm having trouble advancing my slide, just one second. There we go. Oh, where's my data? Oh, I lost my data. Okay, here's the data, sorry. Um, so linguists have long claimed that one cannot predict whether a Spanish uh, mid-vowel, which is an A or an O, will, um, will undergo a phenomenon known as diphthongization. So A diphthongizes to ye, and O diphthongizes to we. Uh, when th this only happens when the stress falls on that vowel, and that vowel is the final is in the final syllable of a stem. Um, so we have we have near minimal pairs like negar niego and pegar pego. Obviously, or Maybe not obviously, but there's simply no reason to suspect that there's something that the that this near minimality tells us anything. There's nothing about n versus p as the preceding consonant that ought to govern this fact. Um, the Spanish speaker simply needs to memorize which vowels to diphthongize. The same thing is arguably true of the Polish fleeting vowels or the yers. Um, we have words like sen, and there the e, uh, the e deletes. It's an E, not an A, I believe. Uh, so you get snu. But we have very similar words like basen, and we get basenu, not basnu. So one simply needs to remember whether or not a Polish E deletes. It's a handful of O examples as well in Polish, but only a handful. Sorry. Um, I will, I'm going to refer to these kinds of alternations as magic. Exactly how the magic ought to be encoded, though, is always unclear. So one, the early work tends to like exploit the feature system and posit phonemes or perhaps archiphonemes or perhaps underspecified uh, feature bundles that do the magic. Uh, how, nowadays, phonologists are likely to use other kinds of tricks, uh, perhaps a phonological or prosodic pre-specification. So for instance, Harris argues that the diphthongizing Spanish ones have like a pre-specified mora. And Rubach has at one point claimed exactly the same thing about Polish years, except for that the, the Polish years are deficient. They lack a mora, whereas the non-alternating as have one already. Um, others have claimed that the, that the magic resides sort of in the morph and not the segment. That's the argument from people like Pater and Guskova. Uh, for, what it, for my purposes, it doesn't really matter right now, uh, but the, uh, whether you, you go with the Pater Guskova analysis where it's the morphs that are exceptional as opposed to the segments. All that matters is that we believe in magic. Regardless of how the magic is encoded, it's a deductive necessity that it be encoded somehow. Clearly, something is representationally different in negar and pegar and sen and basen. Any account which, which just counts this fact will be descriptively inadequate. To make this a bit clearer, consider my little stupid thought experiment, which involves aliens. We are contacted by a benign, intelligent alien race um, from the Rigel system, um, and they happen to be cat-like, I decided. Um, our scientists observe that they, they exhibit a strange behavior. When they drink fountain soda, like soda from a, you know, a fountain machine, their green eyes turn yellow, and when they imbibe soda from a can, they turn red. Scientists have not yet been able to determine the mechanism underlying these behaviors. What might we reason about the aliens magical soda sense. Well, let's say like adopt sort of a uh, kind of vulgar uniformitarianism. So let's reject outlandish explanations like time travel or mind reading, focus on things we know. Only possible explanation remaining to us is that there really is something chemically distinct about those two classes of soda. And the Rigelian sensory system is somehow sensitive to this difference. They must be, they must have a, a chemical sense that allows them to tell about something about the degree of the bubbles or the syrup mixture or something like that that allows them to tell wh whether it came from a can or it came from a fountain soda. Really, this deduction isn't all that different from the one that linguists like Harris and Rubach make. They observe different behaviors in posit distinct elements, entities to explain them. Of course, there's something like ontologically different about soda and Polish E. One is like we can imagine a chemical difference. The other one is 
the other one like has to be it has to go through this sort of uh epistemic process right it like um the epistemic process we call first language acquisition we have to take one type of meat uh, we have to, uh, one type of meat flaps and it it creates the data another another type of meat uh, here's the, the here's that here's that data and then reifies it in the brain and then once again recapitulates it but both of these deductions are equally valid scientific deductions for us to make so I conclude from thought experiment one that we, magic is real, that we, that, we that we have a deductive necessity to, uh, to believe in this kind of phono, morphophonological magic. And of course, there are many other examples of this type of phenomena. I could rattle off a half dozen that might be, that might be called magic in the relevant sense. Quickly, I'd like to give you a second thought experiment. Um, so if mature adult representations have magic, infant's hypothesis space must also include the possibility of positing magical underlying representations, like what Rubach argues for Polish or Harris argues for Spanish. What might happen if the hypothesis space was not so specified? Consider the thought experiment. The Rigelians did not do a good job sterilizing their spaceships. Uh, as I said, they're, cat they're sort of felliform. They like to just lick the flying saucer real good. They don't have like a proper um, cleanliness procedure. Uh, so specks of Rigelian dust apparently carry a retrovirus that infects human infants and modifies uh, their language faculty so that they no longer can entertain magical hypotheses. Uh, what then do we suppose might happen to the Spanish and Polish patterns? Sorry, one second. That I called magic earlier. Initially, the primary linguistic data won't have changed, just the acquisitional hypothesis base for infected infants. What kind of grammar will infected Spanish acquiring babies acquire? I think the answer has to be that the babies will cannot acquire the, the patterns. Uh, there is reason to think that like, uh, I'll give you in a second, that diphthongization is a minority pattern in Spanish. It seems most likely that the children will acquire a novel grammar where it's negar nego rather than the actual negar niego. But not all linguists agree. Uh, Bybee and Pardo do a, a little study uh, with some behavioral data and some corpus data that, that argues that what they call local segmental conditioning on diphthongization. They claim uh, that Spanish speakers may be able to partially predict whether or not a stem will diphthongize, basically looking at nearby segments. Albright et al. Uh, many years later turned this into to a computational model which can extract that kind of generalization from corpus data. So for instance, um, Bybee and Pardo claim that uh, like if you have a following R or an NT or an RT, that makes the E more likely to diphthongize, to ye. And Albright and Hayes claim that a following stem final R, the trill, or MB, also favors diphthongization. I'm not really convinced by, by this proposal um, because they don't really give us a sense of like the coverage of these generalizations. And in the, there's not demonstrated on the basis of really corpus analysis. They're extracted from corpora, but they're demonstrated on the basis of warm tests. Um, the problem is that there's no, there's no strong explicit linking hypothesis from adult generalizations about nonce words to children's generalizations about novel but real words presented in naturalistic settings. But I actually can, I think I can answer this to some degree. So this is, this is some work I'm going to pull from a paper that appeared in Connell with an international team. Uh, let me give you a little background for what we did. Uh, we were interested, so there is a, a, a computational need, this is outside of the world of generative grammar, this is just general computational linguistics, for systems that can perform natural language gener generation. So we one kind of common system that you probably used is weather reporting systems. Usually there's like a template, and then there is a some kind of structure of data that contains the the things we want to fill in the template. But then we have to do a little bit of, we have to do a little bit of like agreement morphology and things like that. Uh, so let's say the wet temperature is 53 Fahrenheit, uh, the conditions are cloudy and the location name is Brooklyn. So then I've got to sort of go through and sort of insert those pieces in. But I got to do a little bit of agreement morphology because the temperature is one degree, we say one degree, not one degrees. And this gets harder real fast. So here's the facts about Russian, um, we have Odin Gradus, uh, Dva uh, Gradusa, um, and uh, Piat uh, Gradusov. 
So if the first, the last term in the first number is singular, we use the nominative singular. If it's pokol, that is to say that the number is two to four, is the rule in Russian inclusive. We use the genitive singular. If it's it's only plural, if it's five or greater, then we use the genitive plural. So you say something like one, one degree, uh, two of degree, and five of degrees, perhaps. That's just the rules. Um, We'd like to build a system instead of having to like list out all the rules for all the Slavic languages. One thing they could like learn this generalization from data. That is uh, the kind of thing that that excites the uh, big tech speech companies of the world. Uh, so people have actually tried to build this out into a shared task or a challenge. Um, and this was a uh, Connell a, a conference and the Sigmor Fund workshop have hosted several shared tasks, including in 2017 and 2018 that looked into uh, sort of a similar type of task. Uh, so you're given a word in citation form, a lemma, and you're given a morphological specification um, and inflection. Of course, these, the, what these specifications mean is, is well described uh, in, a, in the data, but it may look a lot like Leipzig style glosses. Then you're supposed to generate the appropriate inflected form. So you're given an English word um, like permaband and you're asked to generate the past participle, which is permaband. Uh, in German, you get Stiefvater, which means uh, stepfather, quite literally. Uh, and the accusative plural should be Stiefvetter um, because it's plural, so it should it should umlaut. It's an umlaut with them. And similarly in Hungarian and Russian and so on and so forth. So in our study, we actually tried to develop sort of an error taxonomy for these for, for the systems in this task. We looked at the best systems in this task, which are gigantic neural networks, of course. And we tried to um, categorize their errors. This requires us to basically know the language. So we were able to do, I think, like 12 languages as a team, or maybe 14, I forget. Uh, of course, the entire task has like over 60 languages, but we simply weren't able to find a fluent Lithuanian computational linguist in a couple of weeks. Um, we then performed a manual error analysis of the data um, and looked at the patterns. There were quite a few things we learned, most of which aren't interesting to the current audience, but here's one that was interesting. So. Once again, here's the Spanish uh, data, once again, repeating it here. Um, Harris proposes that the mid vowels have extra moraic structure, but one can think of many alternatives to sort of do this sort of thing. So like negar has one more mora than pegar, and that's why it diphthongizes. Uh, so we looked at what kinds of errors the top neural networks make when they try to do this task. Well, so you have an example of um, recolar, which means to strain, or to restrain, excuse me. And they say things like um, recolan, but it should be recuelan. Apparently, the neural nets cannot predict whether, where the diphthongs go in lexemes they haven't seen before. And they're quite bad at this. They make tons and tons of errors of exactly this form. So I think that suggests that Bybee and Pardo and Albright et al. may be on the wrong trip, that uh, the systems that we're talking about are much more sophisticated general purpose string pattern extractors than what was proposed by Bybee and Pardo and Albright in 20 and 40, respectively, years ago. Much more powerful systems. Uh, yet, they are not good at this exact task. They don't know where the magic goes. So my, my pitch to the computational linguists was that we just rediscovered what phonologists could have told you. Some allomorphy is genuinely unpredictable, including these highly abstract morphophonological patterns I call magic. Some other examples we saw are like errors with ablaut and umlaut in Germanic languages, consonant gradation in Finnish, of course that one was hard, uh, of the quality of Hungarian linking vowels, famous example, um, the years in both Polish and Russian, we did with the two Slavic languages we were able to look at, and of course, Spanish diphthongization, which together make up a large fraction of the errors made by the top neural networks. Uh, the other errors are mostly errors in the actual raw data um, because the data is crowdsourced. Now, I want to I want to come back to uh, get back to the productivity question here, having having sort of illustrated the notion of magic. This is from work I did with Charles Young. Um, so you may be familiar with this particular approach to morphophonological um, productivity called the tolerance principle. It's defined as follows. Let me just read the definition here. Suppose a rule R is applicable to N items in a learner's vocabulary of which there are e, of e are exceptions that do not follow R. 
the necessary and sufficient conditions for the productivity of R is that E is less than N over log N, natural log of N. This may seem completely arbitrary to you, but um, read uh, Charles's 2005 paper and his 2016 award-winning book for extensive motivation and empirical investigation into why this might be true. But for our purposes, we just need some kind of way to determine what ought to be productive and not. Perhaps a, minor, a majority rules approach would, would suffice for where I'm going. Um, excuse me one second. Um, the distribution of, I, I argue that the distribution of magic is governed by the logic of productivity. Sorry, one second. So here is some data from Spanish. This comes from the Lex ESP uh, lexicon, which I've used quite a bit for Spanish. It's quite high quality list of Spanish verbs. Uh, I find it quite useful for that. Um, I've separated out the counts of, the diff of these different stem changes by conjugation because the literature has traditionally done that. If I join them all together, I would obtain the same result because the first conjugation is quite a bit larger than the other conjugations. So in the first and second conjugation, we can think of, we just look at the mid vowel stems. These are stems that have an A or an O in the final syllable of the verb stem. Clearly in both the first and second conjugation, a vast majority of verbs are no change. That is to say they don't undergo diphthongization. 105 do in the first conjugation and 23 do in the second conjugation. The third conjugation, which is quite small, there are only a handful of no change verbs. There's, in fact, the most common uh, generalization is something called lowering in the literature, which is the, uh, if you know Spanish, this is pedir pido. It looks like the E goes to an I, but there's reason to suspect it's an actually an underlying I that goes to E, uh, underlying magical I that goes to E. Um, but clearly, uh, clearly the no change thing is the, is the overwhelmingly the default in the two largest conjugations. And so if you apply the tolerance principle, it will tell you that no change is the default. If you apply a majority rules approach, it'll tell you the same thing. Interestingly to see that, that the child errors follow the patterns I just described. Uh, Clausen et al. did a study on this where they looked at about 15 children, 6,000 6, verb tokens. Nearly all errors that involve verb stems, all but four out of 120 involve the under application of diphthongization. What the other ones are, I don't know. I don't think they say. Uh, Mile et al. Did, this, did a similar study looking at a slightly smaller sample, um, but actually looking at the effect of conjugation and different types of morphophonological alternations. Not a single case of errors she found involved over application of diphthongization, but dozens of cases involved under application. Children uh, tend to generalize the no change form just like the neural networks do. Interesting. Now, one question you might have to say, what does this have to do with phonology? Let's assume, and how does this work with the rules? And I don't have an answer yet. Now, this is actually posed to me by Bill uh, Izzardi, who's fortunately on the call, I believe. Let's assume that Harris is right and diphthongization is magic that resides in certain Spanish URs. Perhaps it's pre-specified more often. What does it mean to talk about the productivity of diphthongization, given that URs are by hypothesis stored rather than constructed via rule? Good point. Per Here's one possibility. Perhaps instead of placing it in the UR, we should derive it via morphophonological rules. Perhaps we should reject, we should actually reject Harris's approach and do some kind of deep morpho morphological rules so that pegar and negar look the same underlyingly, but something special happens to negar that doesn't happen to pegar. Are magical URs and morphophonological rules extensionally equivalent? Good question, I don't know yet. Open question for you all, but I'm interested in the question. Next point here, and perhaps my final depending on time, is that loss of productivity may trigger lexical restructuring. Here I'm gonna pull from some um, work and also work, a talk I gave last year about um, Latin roticism. This, this is a little bit diachronic, but the conclusions are synchronic in nature. So hold your horses. Uh, it's well known that in history of Latin, of uh, intervocalic S merged with R in Old Latin. Note, I didn't put star S because we actually have very, very old artifacts that have intervocalic S in them, but it's gone, it's largely gone by the classical era. This change was neo-grammarian in the sense that Bill LeBove talks about, the sense that there were few, if any, exceptions initially. It, uh, that's what he takes to be the uh, the neo the, the neo neo grammarian synthesis. It's essentially that sound change proceeds across the board with little respect um, to things like lexical frequency or spheres of use or any of that any of that crap. Um, the terminus postquem for this is the fourth century BCE. 
because uh, something that Cicero says. Uh, he talks about a, a, a guy named El Papirius Crassus, who was the first of his clan to be called Papirius. Previously, they were called Papicius. Um, so we can say this probably happened in the fourth century BC, but it, um, you know, it could happen. It could have happened. I guess it could have happened later. This change introduced extension of extensive inflectional allomorphy that previously didn't exist. Um, so, for instance, in the masculine noun honos honoris, this is the parade example. Looks like honos honoris. Usually, when we talk about Latin, um, talk about Latin in this context, we look at. Do I have a pointer here? Um, not quickly. Uh, we look at the nominative singular. That's the citation form. And then right below it, the genitive singular is given as a second form. If you know those two forms, you can inflect the vast majority of Latin nouns. Um, so that's what school children learn. And in fact, this paradigm and this fact is something that I and millions of other Catholic school kids across the world memorized in the twilight of their critical period. Um, this is just something you encounter when you study Latin, that there are verbs of this form, or nouns of this form, and there are quite a few of them. Not long after Rhoticism, uh, degemination of geminate S occurred after when it's um, when it's after diphthongs or long monothongs, the two types of heavy nuclei, and that reintroduced intervocalic S. Um, we, we can date this once again thanks to Cicero. Um, S degemination probably happened in about the first century BCE, um, because uh, two centuries later, a grammarian named Quintilian claims that he saw Cicero's handwritten copies, his autographs of his of his works. Like he saw Cicero's original manuscript, like which I guess were being passed around. Um, and he says that Cicero spelled the word causa with a geminate, um, though no manuscript passed down to the modern era contains that. They always contain a single S, causa, which of course is an inner vocalic S, something that shouldn't exist. There's reason to believe that this, that this degemination rule was actually projected into the phonology of the language because there are, there are many instances of synchronic degemination, but I don't have time to show you that today. Just take my word for it. The fact that has attracted so much attention in this literature is that during the classical period, these SR alternations, many of them at least, leveled in favor of an invariant R. So, so we know that Plautus, who's, the, who's one of the oldest well-attested Latin writers and a comic, a comic writer, used honos honoris. Um, Apuleius, who is sort of the uh, late, late empire uh, Plautus, favored hono honoris. Note that there's a shortening in honor, but that's actually independently expected. Um, we, you can see me why, why we, we knew that was going to happen. So that's not a surprising thing. So we have some stems levels. So we have like angor, amor, ardor, candor, cruor, et cetera, all level. We don't ever see angos or amos, does not occur in the corpus. It probably was used, but it's, we just simply don't have any, any tokens of it. We also have uh, many examples that do not level. Um, colos, uh, colores, flos, flores, glis, gliris, which was apparently a delicious snack. Uh, dormouses or dormice was apparently the, the best thing to eat in ancient Rome, um, et cetera, et cetera. We also have doublets. So we find in the corpus arbos, arbor, et cetera, et cetera. Las, lar. If you've seen the movie Gladiator, the, the little dolls that Russell Crowe plays with are the, are the, are the lares, the, the tutelary deities, and so on and so forth. So all three possibilities are, can be found. So schematically and focusing solely on the surface as uh, historical linguists are wont to do, we see that there was an early form honos honosis. Honosis is not attested. Um, there is a early classical form honos honoris and a late classical form honor honoris. And I really shouldn't be pronouncing the H at all. It's probably silent by that point, but not a problem. It's been claimed that monosyllables showed differential behavior, but I don't see any evidence for it. It just doesn't seem to be justified in the data to me because there's exceptions in both directions. So three questions you should have, and I think I'll give you a short answer to all three. What triggered the leveling? Why do some alternations level whereas others do not? And finally, this is probably the big question for the historians. If grammars abhor interparadigmatic stem alternations as so many people have claimed over the years, so many major names have claimed, why is the quantity alternation in hono honoris preferable to the consonantal alternation in honos honoris? I, I, I will present an analysis that answers all three questions for you. Um, so most analyses of classical Latin posit also a synchronic rule of rhoticism. To, in other words, they say that this historical sound change has been projected into the grammar. Let's assume that R is predictably plus voice. Then we can state the rule as basically taking a coronal and making it non-strident when it's intervocalic. This is clearly not surface true. 
a point which is actually made by none other than Ferdinand de Saussure in 1916. Um, he points out that there's a bunch of exceptions in that in the quote from French there. And he uses causa and which uh, and of course resource, which means laughed at as well. That said, generative grammar does not accord any special status to exceptionless generalizations. As Chomsky and Halley note in the uh, preface to SPE, counterexamples to a grammatical rule of, are of interest only if they lead to a construction of a new grammar of even greater generality, or if they show some underlying principle is fallacious or misformulated. So is a new grammar of even greater generality possible here? I would like to say that the answer is yes. It's quite simple. First off, I need to point out that there are quite a few exceptions to roticism. I've mentioned a couple. Um, first off, we can look at nativized Greek. Uh, we know that, there, that Greek was widely spoken by literate Romans and written. Um, but when a Greek word has been given Latin inflectional morphology, as all these have, um, it do, the S can remain intervocalic. Um, so you see words like basis, which means pedestal, or basilica, or, um, or pausa, which means pause, and so on and so forth. Also, words from Germanic, like um, bison, or um, words like geisum, which is the Celtic javelin, also can preserve intervocalic things here. We know that these are Latin words because they have Latin morphology. Uh, we also have quite a few native lexemes, usually at the stem theme vowel juncture. Here's a bunch of um, Latin, um, Latin noun examples, like pusus, little boy, or rosa, rose, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these words are claimed to be um, somehow, uh, I don't know, rustic or something like that. And that may be the, true etymologically, but it's not cl clear why that matters for the synchronic analysis. Finally, we also see this at um, in, in occasional, in some verbs, such as in the verb crisare, um, and so on and so forth. People have attempted to weasel out of this unfortunate conclusion that there's an awful lot of exceptions to eroticism by coming up with additional ad hoc things, but I think they have failed. For instance, it's been claimed that roticism is blocked by a sort of a principle of like R dissimilation, which we might write as something like star RVR. If so, the blocking must be extremely sporadic because um, there's many, many of the examples I showed you in the previous page don't have a nearby R. This doesn't work. Um, further, it's been claimed that roticism is subject to non-derived environment blocking, but not when it's counterfed by S degemination, as Heslin points out, not when it's at prefixation or compound junctures, not when it's at theme, theme stem vowel or theme stem theme vowel junctures, and virtually every noun in the entire language has an exception in the form of a derived adjective formed by adding os plus a vowel initial case suffix. So for instance, we have a, the noun coma, which means hair, and comosos, which means hair, intervocalic s derived. It is what you can see my full counter arguments in that handout if you're interested. Rhoticism clearly has many more exceptions than undergoers. It simply cannot be productive in classical Latin. Let's, the analysis is actually not too hard. Most masculine and feminine third declension nouns form a nominative singular with the S suffix. This suffix devoices final, um, final voiced obstruents, excuse me, and deletes stem final T, D. So we have pleps, plebis, for instance, in A. We have laus, laudis, where the D has been deleted by the S hypo by hypothesis. Similarly, rex, regis, in king there. But the B examples are, are key here. They show that T, D are deleted by S. So let's, let's formulate a rule. Well, one error you might make formulating this rule is you say, OK, well, we just want to delete a coronal when followed by a final strident. That's what this rule says. And there's only one strident in Latin. It's S. There's no sha in Latin, for instance. You also need to make this rule apply rightward, um, rightward or, or that is to say, left to right to get the right uh, result. Uh, you can see the handout for Y. But wait, isn't R coronal too? Well, golly, I wonder if that has any interesting consequences. Well, it does. It turns out, and so, and I just mentioned that N does this too. Um, it turns out that R and N also delete when followed by S, or at least you can, you can hypothesize that. There's it's no, nothing stopping you from saying that. And in fact, you can just say that honos is really the same as, as laus, is that they underlyingly contain a coronal final consonant in the stem that's deleted by S. So I'm, I'm going to claim is that what's happened is a covert leveling has happened. And Hale et al. Um, had argued that the leveling of SR alternations involves lexical restructuring. They argued that, and 
that honos changed to honor at, in ur form. But my, my accidental rule of pre-S deletion allows me to consider that Latin children may have performed lexical restructuring covertly before leveling. Sorry, I'm almost out of time here. Let me just finish the thought and I will uh, kill it here. If the evaluation metric disprefers lexical diacritics and once word, once word has become unproductive, the child can just reanalyze honos as honor followed by an S. They can eliminate the lexical diacritic and obtain the same surface result. Now to, to actually cause the leveling to happen overtly, we just need further changes. The first point is that there is a null nominative singular suffix for this declension. And in fact, it's the most frequent one for our final stems. So we might suspect as Kaparsky proposes many years ago is that a child who simply hasn't heard, um, who hasn't heard the nominative singular citation form would make the wrong guess. They would guess honor as the surface form rather than hon honos. Furthermore, we know that variable deletion of, S, of word final S was already occurring throughout the Latin era. So perhaps that did something else. Perhaps that, that like changed the data as well, but it's kind of hard to say. So very simple, I'll give you the answers and, and, and conclude. Um, what triggered leveling? Neogrammarian sound change in borrowing, followed by loss of productivity, which triggered covert lexical reanalysis. Honos became honor s followed by loss of S, which ultimately revealed the underlying form as the surface form. This seems like the most parsimonious analysis of this fact. Um, why do some alternations level, whereas others do not? Well, it turns out that the proposed covert reanalysis is not tenable for SR alternations in third declension neuters, fifth declension nouns, adjectives, or verb perfects. None of these leveled, so that's perfect. None of these leveled. And the reason is I can't, for none of them can I posit a word final S suffix. So I can't, I can't use this trick. I can't rely on pre-S deletion to obtain the right result. Clearly there are also some lexical effects and perhaps effects of style and things of that fuzzy nature that'll be difficult to discern at this remote historical juncture. But the places where the, where the leveling is available and doubles for formed is only the place that my analysis predicts. So that's a desirable result. If, the, if grammars abhor interparadigmatic stem alternation, why is the quality alterna quantity alternation preferable to the consonantal alternation? Quite simply, paradigm uniformity plays no role. Doesn't matter. I have one more, um, but I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, we I still know. have like, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 minutes for discussion. Great. So, uh, I'll let, maybe should I just let you, you want me to choose the uh, questions or do you want to do it? Um, why don't you go ahead and choose? Okay. Uh, you can, eat, I guess, put on your camera and raise your, your, your real hand. That's easier. Okay, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Kyle. Thanks very much. Thanks for um, providing like the beginning of an answer to the question I, I asked you earlier this year. Um, I think that the one thing that um, I, I, that I don't think you emphasized that, that I would like to sort of um, uh, push a little bit, which I, I think is common to the analyses that say Rubach and Harris, and in fact, you're giving here, is that they're all sort of just directly available. Uh, like, you know, you're not using anything that you didn't already have representationally. You're just saying like, look, it's an R. Uh, and, you know, in the case of um, uh, Rubach and uh, uh, Harris, they're using representational differences that are implied by the uh, existing representations. Basically, they just take something out of an existing representation to make a distinction. And if you can represent the thing with the thing, it seems pretty hard to prevent yourself from representing the thing without it. Um, so like, I think that um, th this, is a, this is a point that like, um, I think people fail to appreciate just how much uh, analytic possibility there is um, just sitting right in front of us, just with the representations that we already have. Um, I agree with that, yeah. So the, the, to come back to the question, do you have a way of sort of thinking now about this in terms of 
uh, like the way that Charles formulated the, um, the productivity principles in terms of rules applying to things. Is there a more neutral formulation of this that talks about like, um, you know, clusters of forms or something? Is there some way that yeah, we can, I that that. we can get this so that it's representational and not just processual? Yeah, that's, that's a huge question I, I'm interested in. I don't know what the answer is. I, I think that Charles wants to be, doesn't want to think about the representational thing. Oh, that's Charles Young, that is not Charles R. Um, doesn't want to think too hard about the representational thing. He assumes that there'll be a good answer. Certainly like uh, relying on the, um, the force of somebody like Jim Harris is probably pretty safe in the case of Spanish because he spent his entire career thinking about this <laughs> set of problems and slowly refined his analysis over the years to get slightly more sophistication. So I, I find that very com compelling, whereas some of the stuff is very new, right? Um, yes, so I first, I wanna say, emphasize that, yes, that if, if, you, if you allow underspecification of representations, you get so much more power, a point that's been made by Charles R, for instance, in recent work, I think very clearly. So I think we should always allow that. It's very clear that we want that, need that, ought to use it to do stuff. Um, that particular type of underspecification is, is really, really useful. And I, I don't like this label opportunistic because it's a deductive logical, it's a deductive logical necessity. Um, just because it's cute doesn't mean it's wrong, you know? I think the D, I think DNA is kind of cute too, uh, but yet it's real. Um, as to how to get out of this processional thing, I think we should do that. I think we need to think about what that looks like. One thing I wanted to talk about is lexical um, exceptionality as in like most things undergo a rule, but this thing doesn't. And there it's very hard to make the, the, the process analysis because you talking about like a, a rule of not doing a thing or something like that. It's very weird uh, conceptually. Like um, um, mo most things, so like think about how you talk about um, obesity from a production well, perspective, I, but it's very ugly, right? Well, in those cases, I think you can just steal the analysis that Jim Harris gives for the diphthongs in the 85 phonology article and sort of say that in forms like obesity, let's say you've already got a doubly linked um, thing so that like it is a long vowel. Then for the long vowels that alternate, you give them an empty X slot. So okay. like, you know, and then they can fill the X slot to become long under those circumstances. Then the rule is delete an empty X slot under various circumstances. I like, I like it. I like it. But I, I got to ask you is like, does it, does it do anything else for me? I guess I, I kind of want, I kind of want some confirmatory evidence. Well, I mean, um, so the, the covert diphthongs that, um, that, you know, Bertzio proposed for getting um, pre-final stress in forms like Kentucky, they also block CIV lengthening. So you get Kentuckian and not Kentuckian. So like there, there are various cases where you have to just then search around to find, you know, does it do anything else for you? But even if it doesn't, like, uh, it's not clear to me that the analysis is like somehow unavailable just yeah. because you don't have another form that, um, you know, that happens to go along with it. Uh, I'll, I'll just end by sort of saying that, that I, did, um, I did have some email with uh, Jim Harris this year. Uh, he turned 90 this year, uh, but he, he was very thankful for me to send uh, your thing with Charles to him. He said it was the best thing that had happened to him during the uh, during coronavirus. Oh, that's really flattering. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That, that means a lot. Any other yeah. questions? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, okay, hi, everybody. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for your for your presentation. It was uh, it was uh, it, it's really uh, it is really uh, interesting topic, and uh, I I have a, a couple of observations and. Uh, at, at one point, I think uh, you you mentioned the, uh, uh, the the problem actually with neural networks with with the uh, uh, diphthong in, in Spanish uh, because of the you know apparently distribution and uh, actually something like that happens even to adult Spanish speakers with with some with some forms and not necessarily because they are infrequent but uh, when, but especially when it's uh it's uh, it's in open syllables, like for example, like you have the uh and it's very strange because you have something like like a verb like ne, uh, negar, which I think was the one that you use, uh but you uh, which actually did defuncts, and you have the the verb nevar to to snow, which yeah. actually defuncts too, uh but but somehow uh, uh 
some Spanish speakers, well, many Spanish speakers have, have a problem with that. And they think it's like uh, neva instead of nieva. Yeah, which okay. would be the which would be uh, the correct form. So and and actually with with a verb like fregar, which means like to do the dishes or to uh, I don't know, you know, in some dialects it means to do the dishes. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's frequent to hear uh, forms like uh, yo frego instead of friego. Yeah. So and and uh, and and the instances that I can think of that uh, which in, uh, where th that happens. They all happen to be uh, in open syllables, yeah. So, so I was wondering if there's something, you know, uh, about the fact that the, it's more frequent when it, you know, after an R or RT, which actually happen to be uh, uh, a closed syllables, right? You no, know, and and uh, I mean, you know, uh, what, what 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 do you think about that? It's possible. Or, I I, I want to know first off, is it synch is it so so you're arguing that it maybe it's a part of someone's sort of like subtle synchronic knowledge. Um, I guess the first thing I do is I'd go back to uh, um, what's the guy Yakov, uh, the the, etym the Spanish etymologist, and ask him whether there's uh -huh. any any good historical reason for this fact to be true. Um, that might be an interesting question to first ask. Um, perhaps you could say something about just preferred structures in rep if, if these things actually have extra or less metrical structure. Perhaps you could say something about just preferred representations there. I, I really don't know though. I, I I didn't know that particular one. Can I ask that the, uh, the verb nevar is that like a weather verb? Like, yeah, that's a, that's a weather verb. Which is it? Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's interesting by itself because you don't you you don't conjugate it. You know, it's, uh, except in the uh, third person. But uh, actually, probably you know, in, in that case, um, it is very frequently the use of the gerund, which actually don't be found. So it's está nevando. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, so it might be you know the, the fact that uh, the, the 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 form of the diphthong is not is not used as often right? like nieva. Okay, uh, but but it actually is, and it's it's similar to other verbs that uh, follow the same pattern. So, uh, but uh, but in that case, it doesn't. Okay, so uh, historically, you know, it has to do with the uh, with the vowel quantity in Latin and everything. But that you know that that, that has, has no bearing synchronically. So um, yeah, yeah. So that's. Uh, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have one more question from uh, time for one more question from Sveta. Hi, Sveta. Thank you. Uh, hi, Kyle. Uh, I have a question about your uh, rhoticism analysis. Uh, so, if I understood you correctly, the the final step to get the nominative singular uh, honor is that uh, based off the oblique forms like the genitive um, honoris the learner drops the the underlying s in the nominative so that it surfaces as honoid and that would and that happened because i think you said there were other animate nouns that ended in r um that had a stem final r that didn't have that that then also had a final r in the nominative singular Right. Okay. That, so then, my question is, one, why one possibility? Yeah. There's two others actually, but that is probably the best one, I think. So then, my question is, why can't you just do that directly? Why do you need to go through an intermediate step with uh, the learner creating a new underlying form for honos that has an R? So if you just if you just start with honos honoris, and then a learner only hears honoris and other forms with R, then the learner assumes that the nominative singular ends in R because there's an underlying R. So why do you need the, the, the intermediate step? Uh, you don't need, I guess you don't need the intermediate step. I think that the, that the evaluation metric um, should favor the intermediate step for a couple hundred years. Uh, there's a couple hundred years where rhoticism is present in these ver in these nouns, at least lexically variably. Yet um, it has an inf uh, essentially an infinitude of exceptions. So the learner ought to eliminate the lexical diacritic by performing the covert restructuring. I know some people are uncomfortable with words like evaluation metric and lexical diacritic, but I believe in both things. Um, the, 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 if the learner wants to represent the grammar of somebody like Cicero, they have no, I don't see any, I don't see any preferable alternative. 
Okay. Okay. I don't understand, but that's fine. Okay. I'm sorry. Thanks. Okay. I think we're going to uh, have to stop and uh, we'll take a five minute break. And thank you very much, Kyle. That was great. Thank you. So we'll be back in, a minute. in five minutes. Okay. Uh, Hilton, do you want to try to share your screen? If you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, get it set up, get it open. Sure. Do you have to stop? Uh, okay, that no, works. Perfect. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. So we got a we got a short break. See you soon. <laughs>